she was here on Sunday. And just looking good. And God is working in her life. So thank God for what he's doing. But let's let's pray for these and for tonight's uh, lesson tonight. Jesus, thank you for your goodness, for your mercy, for your grace. You are so good and so kind. Your word, your word, your word, Lord. Where do we begin to even thank you for the 66 love letters that you give to us, that we might have light in our path, that we might have hope in our depression, that, Lord, we might find strength and encouragement in times of doubt and fear. I thank you tonight for your goodness, and I ask for your anointing to rest upon us as we look to your word tonight, truly. Truly, I pray tonight that you would bless us and that you would move tonight in a very powerful way and that you would minister. In the name of Jesus, we pray and ask you that everyone said amen. 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 Give the Lord a good day. Amen. 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 Be seated. Glory. I forgot to pray for James, didn't I? I was praying for this. I did. I totally forgot about James. I forgot about Sister Eve. Jesus, we come back again. Yes. Part two. Please touch Brother James. I know we already prayed to God. Touch him and heal him and restore his body, restore his health. Bring him out of that place. We pray healing into his body in the name of Jesus. Pray for Sister Eve tonight for healing in her body, for restoration, God. Let your peace that passes all understanding rest on them. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. And Lord, we ask for another. Uh, another portion of anointing, let it be in this house upon us tonight, upon me, upon them, upon all of us, God, that we may be touched and impacted by your word. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Everyone say amen. 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 We are doubly prayed tonight. Doubly ready to go. Amen. <laughs> so it's going to be it's going to be a great night. Say amen. Amen. All right. All right. Well, we are in a year of refuge. And we're also in a year that we don't have a drought anymore. Now they're saying, please stop the rain. I think that's a song. But the snowpack is almost 200% over what it normally is, so everything's going to continue to stay full. So go ahead and water your lawns, drink lots of water. I'm trying to be conservative anyway. It's a year. It's a year. I have no idea where all that came from. But it's a year of refuge for the sanctuary. And, and we're looking at matters of the heart in this first quarter and how to keep our hearts a haven of refuge, a place of peace, a place of safety, a place of restoration, of wholeness and healing. And these matters of the heart become behaviors. And they keep us as a communal church. They keep us as a place of refuge. Because what's inside flows forth. Amen? Well, with this in mind, there are things that can get in your heart. They can affect your heart. And as they flow outward, they can affect your behavior. And they can basically move into a place that they can destroy refuge for yourself. They can take away your peace. They can take away your safety. And really having an understanding that the kingdom of God, the Bible says, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is within you. And we as Americans, we think that the only time we have peace and comfort and all of these things is if we have everything rearranged in a certain way, then we'll have peace. But Jesus said it wasn't, that's not so. Peace comes from within because the kingdom is within. When he was asleep on the boat, remember the story? He woke up and he rebuked the storm. He was sleeping in a storm. The circumstances of life and the things of life did not affect what was going on in the inside of him because he was sleeping, if you please, in the kingdom. He was being ruled by the kingdom. When you get full of the kingdom, the kingdom dominates the natural world. So you might not have everything rearranged. You might not have it all in place. But you can still have peace in the midst of the storm. You can still go to sleep at night. Because it flows from within. And it affects the behavior on the outside. Now, again, as toxins, as things get a hold of our hearts, they can destroy our personal refuge. And then they bleed into our communal communal refuge, the community, and they fracture, and they destroy, and they hurt, and they affect uh, in different myriad ways. They can be very dangerous, very hurtful. And so the kicker of all of this is that they come naturally. The things that naturally happen are, are part of our nature. They naturally, we have to fight against them. These, these things that get in our heart, they leak out. And when they leak out, they affect our behavior, and they can cause us to see things do things, 
And it's just part of our human nature. The Bible tells us to be alert, to be aware of it, to be cognitive. And even though our culture feeds on the subject that I want to talk to you about, our culture feeds on it every day. Our society it accepts that it's the normal part of life. Our society is driven by it. Our culture feeds on it. It's just a normal way of life. Is it any wonder why there's no peace in the world, in our culture? I mean, you, you would think that there would be some peace, but the problem is that this, this human nature, this thing that just has a way of getting in everyone, everyone's affected by it, everyone's partook of it, because it's such a normal, normal thing of human nature. But just because it's normal, just because it's part of our nature, just because society feeds on it, just because the culture feeds on it, doesn't mean that it's okay with God or that God approves of it. Amen. It doesn't mean that. It, it means that there might be a battle going on. It means that there's going to be some conflict with my human nature and something has to die. That's right. Are you with me? Yes. So, I want to talk to you about a subject tonight that has the ability to disrupt refuge, to cause destructive patterns of refuge, and to rob the peace, the safety, the wholeness of refuge as a community as even in your own individual heart. And so that topic tonight that I think is so important that we need to talk about is this. Gossip. <laughs> well, you look elated. I promise you it's not going to be as bad as you think. This is different. This is a positive thing. I, now look, God is our refuge. Gossip, they, are, they, they don't even go together, do they? How can there be harmony with those two words. Amen. All of us hate that word. But all of us have partook of that word. Amen. Amen. It's just a part of human nature. Now, if you don't like my message tonight or you don't agree with it, you can always go home and gossip about it later. <laughs> um, but I hope, I hope the way that I've laid this out, that I feel like the Lord has helped me, I hope it will impact you and show you something different about gossip and how it can affect your own heart yes. and how it affects the air and how it affects your own personal peace and what it does to your household, yes. what it does Amen. to a church and how God views it. I think it's real important that we look at how God views it. I mean, right. let me put it to you this way. To which is gossip more similar, robbery or murder? Both? Murder. 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 Because robbers can always give back what they've stolen. But a gossip can never repair the damage they've done. Amen. Right. Ever. Amen. How many of you have ever been gossiped about? <laughs> Someone talking about you? Amen. Yeah, I know. It's very painful. In my line of work, it kind of comes with the territory. Amen. It's just the way it goes. It happens. Amen. I'm going to get a sign and put it in my office. It says, if you want to make everybody happy, don't be a pastor. Go sell ice cream. <laughs> because if I sell ice cream, that would make, that makes everybody happy. <laughs> so it's just in my line of work, in my calling, this is just a normal part of it. But in our culture today, gossip just seems to be necessary to make it through life. It seems just to get through the workplace, you've got to go through a minutia of all kinds of things that people are saying in the office or at school. Gossip's just a way of life in 2017. And it's part of normal conversations with people. I mean, we've all heard, hey, I'm not really supposed to tell anybody this, but you're not going to believe what I've heard. <laughs> hey, wait until you hear what everybody's saying. Hey, you've got to promise not to tell anybody this, but I'm about to tell you something you're going to really want to hear. And so what has happened is because it's so normal, because it's a part of our culture and society, we just think, well, it's no big deal. It's, you know, it happens. Things happen. I mean, everybody's doing it. It's just part of our nature. Like you said, it's part of our nature. Well, again, just because it's so wrapped up in our human nature and just because it's so wrapped up in our culture, society, doesn't mean that God's okay with it. In fact, the church ought to be in direct contrast to that. Can I get a witness? Amen. So tonight I want to define what gossip is, 
And then I want to look at what God says about gossip. Amen. And I think by defining it, I think that we can all say that, ooh, that hurts a little bit. And then when we hear how God feels about it, I think we can all say, ooh, I didn't really think it was that serious. And then we can look at it from the standpoint that we can be better. Amen. That we can be better for Jesus and we can keep our peace. Because I need peace. Do you need peace? Yes. Amen. Now, there are many definitions of gossip. But I looked for many, I studied, I was looking for the most practical um, definition I could find. And so basically, a literal definition to me that is very workable, that we can make application, is this. Gossip is speaking to someone about a situation who's neither a part of the problem or a part of the solution. This is gossiping. Let me say it again. Gossip is speaking to someone about a situation who's neither a part of the problem or a part of the solution. In God's eyes, it's somebody that is not directly related to the problem, but they feel that they need to talk about the problem. Are you with me? They're not a part of the problem. They're not a solution to the problem, but they feel they need to talk about the problem. That's probably gossip. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I know we're all going, wow, okay. Um, I mean, if you're sharing something, if you're not a part of the problem or the solution, then it's gossip. I'm just giving you the definition of it. Now, it's an interesting perspective when you're talking about some, something with someone who's not a part of the solution or the problem and you're sharing these details, you are gossiping. Amen. Amen. It's the facts. You need to own it. Because we've all done it. Yeah. Don't be like, oh. No, we need to say, wow, I never, I never really. Amen. I was just trying to be prayerful and helpful. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm giving you some scripture here. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you some scripture here. But I want to define what it is. So think about it from this standpoint. Because gossip has many definitions. But all of them tinge to this thing right here. Sharing something that you're not really a part of. That you think is so important. You're not a part of the solution nor the problem, but you're going to talk about it. That is gossip. Mark it down. Because that's how God receives it. So it's imperative that we think about this for a moment. We all have been guilty of gossip or talebearing, as the Bible calls it. Old English word. That's telling a story and keeping telling it and on and on and on. So no one is guiltless in this matter. We've all fallen victim to it, and we know it's hurtful and destructive it can be, yet it's so easy, it comes naturally, we just can't help ourselves. So we think, well, it's just so natural, it's not that big of a deal, but what does God say about it? This is what is really important, and if you want to take notes tonight, I put my points on the PowerPoint screen, uh, so really those are my notes, I should have made a PowerPoint slide or a uh, handout for you, but time and things of that nature, But so you can write down the points, because I, I have them up here for you, but look at what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 6. Verses 16 through 19. These six things the Lord hates. Yes, seven are an abomination to him. Now, abomination is a huge word with God. That means he detests it. He hates it. It gets under his skin. It, it drives him crazy. It's an abomination. That means to him, he's like, get as far away from me as possible. I will judge it harshly. A proud look, a lying tongue, hands that shed innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil. In verse 19, a false witness who speaks lies and one who sows discord among the brethren. Amen. Amen. One translation, the New Living Translation, puts it like this. God despises a false witness who pours out lies and a person who stirs up conflict in the local community. Someone that stirs up conflict. Now, God says, I can't stand it. I can't, I detest gossip. This is gossip. Now, I, I, I ask myself, God, these are such strong words on this little short list of things that you hate, things that are abominable to you. Why would gossip be on this short list and why would it be so serious? And, you know, when I, when I think about it from that standpoint, you might think, well... I might have a couple of reasons. You might have a couple of reasons. Well, I have a couple of thoughts, possibly, a couple of reasons why I think. I think the first one, I mean, you know, if someone talks about you, you're kind of like, eh, okay, right? You're kind of like, eh, it's life, right? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe you're freaked out by it. 
But if you have children and somebody talks about your kids, how does that make you feel? How does that make you feel? Someone talks, it makes you mad because you, you get fired up. You're like, I'm upset about this. I'm going to do something about this. This makes me mad. Right? It's just human nature. That's right. Have you ever thought about this? Whose kids are we? God's. Why does it make him so mad? Why does he say it's an abomination and he hates it? He detests it? Because we are his kids. What did he say to the apostle Paul before he became Paul when he was Saul? When he was persecuting the, the church? When he was persecuting the saints? He confronted him, knocked him down, got him off his little high horse for persecuting his body. Amen. Why thou persecutest thou me? Amen. Because that's my body. Amen. Those are my kids. I know they're not perfect. I know they make mistakes. I know they have failure. I know they say and they do this, but they're mine. Amen. And I don't want you touching them with your mouth or with your hand. Amen. We don't like it and we're made in his image. Maybe one of the strong points that we can learn here is that God is saying, these are my kids, and it fires me up when you talk about them. Amen. Don't touch them. Amen. If we could do like David, David wouldn't even put his hand on Saul. Amen. David refused to touch Saul. Amen. Those that do and touch, they suffer the consequences of the mis mischief that they stir up. And it, it, God despises it. Amen. He detests it. Mm -hmm. But yet, that doesn't stop human nature. I'm just giving you God's perspective on this and how to keep refuge in your own personal heart. Now, you know, we might say, well, wow, that may be one reason why it's so offensive to him. But what's odd, even though it's incredibly wrong and hurtful to talk about somebody else, there's something sickeningly, sickeningly attractive about gossip. Have you ever read Proverbs 18.8? The words of gossip are like choice morsels. They go down deep into the innermost parts. There's something enjoyable about participating in the destructive sin of gossip. Something in our human nature that we gravitate to it, that it puffs us up or builds us up, or it's something that we're drawn to. The wise man said the words of gossip are like choice morsels. They go down deep into our innermost beings, but they, they, they sow something in our hearts, a toxin. And they change outlooks, and they take away peace. That's right. Right. Amen. If there's no peace in your house, maybe we should look at what we're talking about, Amen. what we're saying. Amen. If people are struggling to find peace, maybe we should find out what we're listening to. Amen. Holy Ghost homes are supposed to be full of peace. Yeah. Because the kingdom of God is there. That's right. Yeah. But when you live by the human nature and you bring things into your house, you will reap the whirlwind of the things you open the door to and the things you listen to and the things you communicate. That's right. Amen. That's all right. Amen. And if there's something enjoyable about this, what is this? I mean, why do we gossip? Why do we participate in gossip? Why is the drive to do it so strong? Barner Research Group did a study a year or so ago, and they were just asking because... Gossip is destroying more and more people's lives. It causes such stress in people that they are having medical issues because of it. Amen. And so I found some of these. I put these up here. These are some quotes from the Barna Research Group on why people gossip. Well, honestly, I'm sharing gossip. It makes me feel kind of important. I've got the power in the situation, and all of a sudden I feel elevated. Others said, when I'm hearing gossip, it makes me feel better about myself. I mean, there's something great when someone else looks bad, and it makes me feel good about myself. Mm -hmm. Honestly, I think I've got such a boring and dull life. Hearing something juicy on someone else, it's like entertaining to me. <laughs> One of the main reasons that people can, that they, they take up gossip and they continue is it, and in it is because it justifies their behavior. Because they're bitter. And what I'm doing in, the, in their heart of hearts, Holy Ghost filled people, you hear what I'm saying right now? Holy Ghost filled people that take up gossip and they take an offense that doesn't even belong to them because they're involved with something that they're not the problem, they're not connected to it, they're not the solution to it, but they've taken the offense on. They have to justify their actions. So they are going to just spew out toxin. 
And the more they tell it, the better they feel about what they're doing because they're not listening to the conviction of the Holy Ghost that says, look, can't you see the testimony in your own house of no peace? Can't you see what you're doing in the direction that you're going? And so they go down in this path and they have to justify and they have to justify. And so the more they tell and the more they get people on their side and the more they get people to understand what I'm saying, they feel so much better. But it's not right. It's not healthy. Gossip causes you to be highly deceived. It takes away your ability to be humble. All of these don't sound like humble people. They sound like selfish people. Amen. Humility is the key to keeping yourself full of the Holy Ghost. Humility is the key to keeping you safe. Humility and submission submission, and having an understanding of spiritual authority in your life gives you freedom and peace. Amen. When you disregard the spiritual authority in your life, when you disregard God's spirit, when you disregard God's word, when you do what you think is right, you watch peace go out the door. If I was on my Instagram, I'd say, I'd do a hashtag, I'm really preaching right now. <laughs> See, the bottom line is, I don't find a single good reason to participate in gossip. At the end of the day, the Barna Research Group said the very fact that the gossip brings is every reason that we might do it, it really is a reflection of the darkest darkest depths of our own heart and our own sin. Why do you think God may hate gossip? Number one reason could be because he hates it when we make his children look bad. Amen. Number two, the reason it could be that he hates it so much because it's a reflection of the darkness and sinfulness of the human heart and the ability to sow discord, to break up what God is trying to do. The gossiper does not care about the kingdom of God. The gossiper does not care about hurting people. The gossiper does not care about other people's souls. He cares about his offense. He cares about his problem. Because if he did care about the kingdom, he'd be more concerned with others than himself. Amen. He'd be more concerned with the kingdom. I don't want to bring shame or I don't want to bring hurt on the kingdom of God. I don't want to disrupt what God is doing. I will stand back and I'll humble myself and let God do his business. But when a gospel gets involved, they want to do the business. And all they're going to reap is a whirlwind of hurt and pain. Amen. Because God hates it. God said, I hate it. Why do we gossip? Not a single good reason. Culture may say it's okay, but God says no. And as followers of Jesus, we need to live above and beyond the culture. Right. We need to not let what they're doing get in our own heart, in our own soul. We need to live above, above it. We need to live according to his word. His word needs to be the lamp to our feet. His word needs to keep me on track. His word is what I need to align my life with. His word is what ought to direct me. His spirit backs up his word. I ought not to neglect the word. Mm -hmm. That's all right. Amen. Yeah. Even though everybody else is doing it. I want to live in a way that is pleasing to him. So how do we overcome the sin of gossip? Well, I broke it down into three questions. And I want to raise these questions because I believe they're very helpful to all of us on how to overcome gossip. So when you find yourself in that situation where you're going, blah, 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 blah. And this is the blah, 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 blah. You need to stop for a second to the person you're talking to and saying, hmm, the first question I need to ask myself is, well, am I a part of this problem? Am I a part of the solution? If not, then I should close my trap. But if I'm already too far, I need to ask myself this question here. I need, I need to really think about this. Is my conversation helpful, helpful or hurtful? Amen. Is my conversation helpful or hurtful? Because this is what the guy that was hurtful to the early church. The guy that persecuted, the guy, the guy that killed people, that was so destructive, that was so hurt by what was going on because he thought the church was, was a cult that was going to break up Judaism. He had no idea what God was doing. But he, he saw the light. Literally, he saw the light. Okay, He saw the light. And this is what he wrote in Ephesians 4.2. This is the NIV. Do not let any wholesome talk, or excuse me, do not let any unwholesome talk 
come out of your mouths, but only what is helpful or building others up according to their needs that it may benefit those who listen. Amen. Amen. That's all right. If you're taking notes, is my conversation helpful or hurtful? The wise man said in Proverbs 16, 27 and 28, a scoundrel plots evil and his speech is like a scorching fire. It's a blaze. It sets lives on fire. It burns people. A perverse man stirs up dissension and a gossip separates close friends. A gossiper divides. It's so quiet in here tonight. This is so serious. It's really, it's just life. It's good. <laughs> Your words can burn. Your words can hurt. A troublemaker plants seeds of strife. And what does gossip do? Gossip separates best friends. Gossip separates brothers and sisters. Gossip separates the work of God. Gossip destroys. It's destructive. And peace goes out the window. If you're an advocate for peace and you want some peace, you need to really, really think about what you're getting involved with in some things. That's right. See, is my conversation helpful or hurtful? We need to start asking ourselves this. Is it helpful or hurtful? Because the, the good apostle said that I should speak wholesome words, not unwholesome words. And my words ought to be helpful and they ought to build up others. And it ought to benefit those that are hearing me. Not stain them, not disrupt them, or mess them up in their own walk with God. See, as a pastor, I live in the basement of everybody's lives. There's a lot of junk I could come home and spew out, but I don't. Why? I, my wife doesn't need to know that. There's brothers and sisters, you don't need to know that. But I don't understand. I guess it's human nature. Some people feel they need to tell their story, but they don't know the damage that they're doing and they, they divide and they separate and they destroy and they feel so justified in what they're doing. But all the while there's God tracking behind them. See, again, if you're not a part of the solution and you're not a part of the problem, the best thing you can do is step out of it. Because otherwise you're going to get drowned to powder. See, let's just be real honest. We all do this. We, we disguise gossip. <laughs> you know what we do? We disguise it. We, we do these compliment sandwiches. <laughs> we do. You know, like someone will say, hey, what do you think about this brother? I'm thinking about hiring him. You know what we say. We say things like, oh, he's a great brother. He just, yeah, he's doing good. He's, he's coming along. He's doing good. He loves God. But, but you know, I don't know if he could do you a good job. I don't think he's going to do that good. I... I I mean, I think he's got a theft problem. And I mean, I don't know. And, you know, I heard this and I saw that. And so, but you know what? He's a great guy. He's a great guy. So there's a compliment and then you go down deep and then you feel horrible. So then you load on another compliment. I call that a compliment sandwich. <laughs> you give a compliment. We do this. We all do it all the time. We're, it's so a part of us. We don't even know we're doing it. I, I'm preaching on this. I'm teaching on this so we can be aware if we're going to be a house of refuge, if we're going to be a place of refuge, if we want our homes to be a home of refuge, then we have to take the principles and the word of God and we have to let it just get a hold of our hearts till it changes our behavior. Otherwise, we will not have the home of peace. We will not be at peace. Amen. But if we allow it to get inside of us to where it changes us. I mean, I know one of the number one gossip sessions is prayer meetings. It's the truth. You know what we who do we need to pray for in this prayer meeting? Well, you know, I drove by poor sister Olga's house. <laughs> and I saw that car out there at six o'clock. That car, that car belongs to her hillbilly boyfriend. It does. Jeff Roll was there at six. He was there at twelve. And you know what? I just happened to drive by at three a.m. and he was still there. And you know what? I drove by at six. It wasn't. I didn't go to look. And it was still there. Do you realize this woman is shacking up with Jethro? Oh, we need to pray for her. She is in sin. She is living in sin. She is shacking up. This is horrible. Can we please pray? And after 45 minutes of talking about, about poor Olga and Jethro, not knowing all the facts, then we have about 10 minutes to pray. 
for them. Are you with me? <laughs> now, it's amazing to me because the car was there. She saw the car. It's true, right? The car was there all those different times. I mean, it's true, right? If the car is there, then, hey, if it's true, then there's no limit. We can talk about it, right? I mean, it's fair game, right? No. no. Hear me. Scripture doesn't say the line of delineation is true or untrue, but helpful or unhelpful. Amen. Helpful or hurtful. See, here's the deal. Everything you say must be true. But everything that's true does not need to be said. Amen. I'm going to say it again. Everything you say must be true. But everything that's true does not need to be said. Right. There are some things that are, we're called to keep, not to disseminate. Somebody needs to help me out because I'm going to say it again. Everything you say must be true, but everything that's true does not need to be said. It's, is your speech, is your conversation, is it helpful or is it hurtful? It's true, the car was there. But what everyone didn't know is that it broke down three days ago. Come on, preacher. He wasn't even there. He couldn't move it if he wanted to. He's broke. <laughs> See, the next question we're going to look at, first question again, in remembrance, and just going back through it, is my conversation helpful or hurtful? My second question that you need to ask yourself when you are finding yourself going blah, 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 am I making private matters public? Because just because it's true doesn't mean that I have license to make it public. Proverbs 11, verses 12 through 13. It is a foolish to belittle one's neighbor. A sensible person keeps quiet. DP translation. It's a foolish thing to talk about your neighbor, and a sensible person keeps his big mouth shut. Right. Amen. That's right. A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. Amen. Let me say it again. A gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. Amen. Amen. It's powerful. Yes, amen. I mean, that to me is important. Mm -hmm. There are some things that should be kept private. Amen. amen. I mean, am I making something private, public? Amen. If I'm not a part of the problem and I'm not a part of the solution, then I should stay out. Yes. Right. Otherwise, it's gossip. Amen. Done. That's what it is. Amen. Right. Call a spade a spade. Yes. Deal with it. Yes. Stuff happens. Amen. We live in a messed up world. <laughs> but we're talking about something in regards to the kingdom of God and the power of God who can transform lives. And God has given us the ministry yes. of reconciliation, yes. of restoration, Amen. of favor. Amen. And there are some things that need to remain private, not public. Amen. I mean, how would you like if I got up here and just started talking about your problem? You probably would never come back. <laughs> Gossip does what? Gossip goes around telling secrets, but those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence, can keep a secret. And I'm making private matters public. I mean, I'm going to give you an example, a true story. Years gone past. The names are... Not told to protect the people. <laughs> Husband did something wrong. Got caught in adultery. Wife couldn't stand it. She was embattled with shame. She wanted to leave. But she started to forgive. She started to work through. He was working through. And so in a matter like this, it was very hush-hush, and we were trying to work with it. And so there came a time when we needed to bring other people into the circle that could help the situation. That could help men. There could be some accountability for the man. Some accountability and support for the woman. Because they're on the healing men. It's going good. But one of the people that we brought in to the inner circle decided that she just needed to tell another sister so that sister would pray. But that sister said, I need to put this on Facebook so that everyone can pray. The marriage fell apart. 
because then everyone found out and she was so shamed and so rocked her world, she left. That marriage was on the heel. It was moving in the right direction. That marriage didn't die because of adultery. It died because of gossip. Amen. 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 A gossip goes around telling secrets in the guise of I'm spiritual. Amen. No. You're carnal. Those who are trustworthy can keep a confidence. I'm amazed at some people because the Bible says they're ever learning, but they never can. They're never able to come to knowledge. How many relationships in your past have been affected because of your mouth? Amen. That's something you need to pray about. Amen. How many times has this got you in trouble? Yes. And maybe it's time that we really make some changes. Amen. Maybe it's time you really realize, hey, yes. I didn't realize there's a shadow walking behind me, and it's God, yes. and he's upset mm -hmm. because it's so serious to him. I know. It's like, oh, this is so sad. I know there was a case in our, just a few years ago, there was a young man, and he got relocated in the morning for work. He was a security guard. So he would be very early in the morning in a certain area, and there was a Starbucks. And he was there working, and he said he saw a, a man, a prominent man in our congregation, go there and meet up with a woman and make out with that woman. So he came to church, and he started telling me this. Stop. I don't even want to hear it. This is the day of cell phones. Why don't you just go confront him? Why don't you go walk up to him? Take a picture. But he'd already started to tell it to two other people, so I had to grab them, break them all into my office and say, Stop. You are spreading gossip. You don't have any proof. How far away were you? I don't know, three football fields away, but I know it was him. What are you? Do you have a bionic eye? That's slander. That's gossip, but we were able to quilch it, and we were quilch it. Is that even a word? Quench it. It is now quilch it, DP uh, um, But we were able to stop it and, and help him to see. I gave him some scripture. I said, now look, this is what's going to be hanging over your head from God, if you, from, from the Holy Ghost. If you think you can keep telling this and you start spreading this rumor, Amen. you could affect this man's marriage. Because you plant a seed of doubt. And I know all of you right now are wondering... <laughs> because inquiring minds want to know, right? You're never going to find out, so don't ask. I'm just telling you how dangerous and how, it's, how volatile it is. Social media. I mean, we won't go call 300 people, but we'll put something on Facebook that 1,000 people can read. And then we'll say, I, I didn't know. I was just trying to pray. <laughs> See, let me put it to you this way. Gossip. It's taking something that was meant to be private and making it public. Gossip. Mm -hmm. Write it down. Put it on your refrigerator. Next time you want to talk about something, think, oh, wait a minute. i got to back up here. I don't want to be in trouble with God. Amen. Now, you can, I understand that people are ever learning and they keep going and possibly you've been down the same path. But there comes a time when God said enough is enough. There comes a time when you reach the end of God's patience. And if you don't make change, you will be ground to powder. Amen. I'm just giving you the Bible, okay? I'm just preaching you what the Holy Ghost gives me. Again, I said you can go home afterwards and you can talk about it. <laughs> Gossip, it's taking something that was meant to be private and making it public. And I'm, not, I'm just not going to be a part of that. As a pastor, I can't. I mean, if you're not a part of the problem or the solution, then stay out of it. One, I believe, is because I want to protect others, and I will do that, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to go there. Secondly, quite honestly, I also want to protect myself. Amen. Amen. That's right. I want to protect my reputation that I'm a trustworthy person who can keep confidence. I mean, if someone mentions your name and immediately they go, oh, you should work on that. <laughs> If there's a reputation of a drama queen going on, you should work on that. <laughs> this is making sense. Yes. I mean, Proverbs 25, verses 9 through 10 says, When arguing with your neighbor, don't betray another person's secret. Or others may do what? The verse 
goes on, others may accuse you of gossip and you'll never regain your reputation. Yeah. That's from the wisdom writer. That's from Solomon. When arguing with your neighbor, with a brother, with a sister, don't betray their secrets because you're mad or you think you have a right to do it. That doesn't make it right. Don't make private matters public because you think you need to do it. You are stepping into gossip, to judgment, and you're going to invoke the judgment of God. You can justify all you want. Do you have peace in your home now? Do you have wholeness in your home now? In the end, others will accuse you of gossip. And you'll never regain your reputation because you sow what you sow, you're going to reap. So is my conversation helpful or hurtful? Am I making private matters public? Number three, we're going to go real quickly. Number three, am I permitting others to gossip? <laughs> this is fun, isn't it? Am I permitting others to gossip? Proverbs 17, 4, wrongdoers. Say it with me, wrongdoers. Oh, I can't hear you. Come on, help me out, people. Wrongdoers. Wrong Just give me the Bible. Wrongdoers eagerly listen to gossip. Liars pay close attention to slander. Wrongdoers eagerly. Tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. Ooh, wop, wop, ooh, wop, wop. Give me the juicy morsels so I can really, oh, I can't believe that, really. They pay close attention to slander. In other words, not only is it wrong to speak the gossip, it's also wrong to listen to the gossip. Why? Because what you permit, you promote. What you permit, you promote. If you listen and you take it in, you are promoting it. If I'm not a part of the problem or the solution, why am I listening to this? If you listen to it, you are participating in it. If you are listening to it, you are actually facilitating it. What you permit is what you promote. Yeah. Wrongdoers eagerly listen and think and ponder. Is this making sense? Yes. Yeah. See, yeah. besides all that, a very practical standpoint, if they will gossip to you, if they will gossip, to, if they think your ear is a trash can that they can dump their acid into, mark it down. They will talk about you some point in time. If they will gossip to you, they will gossip about you. I'm just giving you scripture. This is what the wise man said. This is why it's so destructive and God said, I can't stand it. I hate it. Gossip divides. Gossip is destructive. And so we're not going to hang around with that kind of behavior if we want peace, restoration, if we want wholeness, if we want healing. You can't allow that kind of behavior because it's toxic to infect you. It will rob you of peace. You'll lose sleep at night, wondering, contemplating. Just give it over to God. If I'm not a part of the problem. If I'm not a part of the solution, what am I doing, listening, talking, being involved in? I'm going to step out of this. I don't need this in my life. Amen. Don't take, the, don't take somebody else's offense on yourself. It will destroy you. It's the truth. I mean, can we just get real practical here, being that I need to wrap this up? Dealing with, am I permitting others to gossip? Let me get real practical. I'm going to give you real quickly four different ways to stop the conversation from headed down the path of gossip. Amen. I mean, they're calling you every day. Can you believe this? This is just, I got to talk about it. It's just, I'm going to call you every day about this and just give you my minutia. I mean, the subtle way is, you know, when they start to go down that path, you can say this. I, I'm not fearing, feeling very comfortable with this conversation. That's the subtle way. I'm just This is not going in the direction. The caring way is if blank knew, you can fill in the name, if blank knew we were talking about this, if, if Olga knew we were talking about her like this, it would break her heart and hurt her. This isn't pleasing to God. I don't feel comfortable, and I don't think she would approve of it, and I, I don't believe God likes it. Mm -hmm. If you want to be biblical, if you have a problem with them, go talk to them. Come on, preach it. If you have a problem with them, go straight to them. 
Amen. Why are you talking to me? I'm not a part of the problem. I can't be even a part of the solution. Why are you telling me? Oh, I know you're trying to justify your actions and your behavior, but why are you talking to me? I'm going to be biblical about it. In fact, why don't you do what the Bible says and forgive them? Pray for them, the Bible says. Forgive them. Love them. Why don't you do what the Bible says? Humble yourself. Maybe you don't know everything. Why don't you do what the Bible says? Give them the benefit of the doubt and pray blessing upon them, goodness upon them. Do good to those that despitefully use you. Why don't you do the Bible? That's biblical. That's right in their face. And then if you really want to be direct, if you keep talking about others, I'm going to hang up on you. You can do that one with attitude. What you're doing is destructive. You're hurtful. I'm sorry, this behavior is unacceptable. It's not becoming a Christian. I want to be saved. You are affecting my salvation by giving me this puke because you think you need to say this. I'm sorry. I am so sorry. I can't receive this anymore. And if you keep going down this path, then I'm telling you, I want to be saved. It's none of my business. I, I mean, again, just, can you see my ear? What does my ear look like? I don't need my heart tinged or affected by the puke you're going to tell me about this person. Furthermore, God is not approved of what you're doing. That's God's kid. You're wrong. Repent. Humble yourself. See you later. When you get prayed through, come back. That's how you keep yourself. That's a little bit more direct, more straightforward. See, again, the person, if you tell them with that kind of attitude, you better mark it down. If you stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with them and trying to put them in their place, I'm going to promise you this is what they're going to do. They're going to gossip about you. Well, they just, they got too much of that. Uh, they've been talking to someone else, and they've been affected. And I tried to show them the light, but they didn't see the light, and they're just so messed up. They're so backwards in their, in their selves. If there's no humility, there can be no healing. That's right. And then people think I'm going to run here and I'm going to run there and I'm just going to, excuse me? What about your spiritual authority? Yes. The Bible says you, give, you were given one pastor and he's going to give an account for your soul. You can run wherever you want, but when we stand before God, it's going to come back right here. So you better make it right. You can run all over the place, do whatever you want. That doesn't make it better. When did God ever say you could be free from that? Hurts, wounds, offenses, they don't justify any of that behavior. Amen. You can talk to try and justify it, but that doesn't justify it. No. At the bottom of the list is your soul and the sake of your own sanity and the sake of your own refuge. I mean, you might be saying, wow, okay, so now I'm subtle, caring, biblical, direct. What are you saying, DP? It means I can never talk about somebody unless they're there. I mean, that's what you're saying? I can't talk about anybody? That's not what I said. That's not what I said. Listen, you can talk good about people all day long. You can brag on them all day long. You can talk positive and love and goodness and build them up. Paul said, let your talk be wholesome and uplifting and positive and let it feed souls. He just said, if you're going to say something about somebody, let it be something positive. It'll come back to you tenfold. It'll come back to you pressed down, shaken. It'll come back to you and bless your house and give you peace. Amen. You know, we can talk about them in a way that can help them. And, and I, I say it like this. Sometimes we talk about situations in third party situations. But if you're going to say and talk, those are very rare. And when you do... Say it with the mindset that if they were here, I would be saying this right in front of them. And the mindset is to bring help to them. Yeah. Say they're bound by alcohol and they won't see the truth that they're bound and it's destroying their family. So four brothers get together and they finally have a confrontation with this man and said, look, you're destroying your house. We love you. We're your brothers. We're your, we're your warriors in arms. We are going to confront you now and stand toe to toe to you and tell you we love you. We've, we've been meeting and praying about your situation and we're here to hurt. We're not here to tell everyone. We're here to conceal it and to help you and bring healing to your life. We are restorers. We've been given the ministry. We have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Our mission.
mission is to bring favor back into your life, to reconnect you with God. My business is not to judge you for your sin. My business is not to spread junk. My business is not to tell you how wrong that person is. My job is to humble myself and love you regardless and bring about healing and restoration. Even if it rubs me the wrong way or I disagree, I have to be saved. Because if not, you get into areas that you don't belong. Judgment belongs to God. Vengeance belongs to God. I'm going to show them. I'm just going to say this and run away. That's vengeance. That's hurtful. That doesn't solve anything. It just makes you feel better. See, saying something constructive, you can say it in the hopes and with the point that I'm going to do something good with this. See, everything is measured. Everything has an understanding to it. Everyone in the conversation wants to help. Because helping is the bottom line. We want rehab. We want uh, freedom. We want healing. We want restoration. That's the whole motive why I'm talking to you. If I'm only talking to you to fill your ear full of putrid junk to make myself feel better, that is 100% gossip. Mm -hmm. And you just got downloaded on it. Now you have to deal with the minutia. Just say, God, this is, I'm not a part of the problem. I'm not a part of the solution. So I don't want to become a part of the problem. So I'm out of it. Don't talk Amen. to me about that no more. Amen. Why are you bothering me with that? Amen. Don't you have something else to worry about? Come on, preach. See, your words matter. Notice what Jesus said. But I tell you that everyone will have to give an account, Matthew 12, 36 to 37, on the day of judgment, for every empty word. One translation says every idle word. Everything you spoke. You're going to have to give an account. Now, for some people, they're going to be there for a long time. <laughs> for by your words, by your words, you will be acquitted. And by your words, you will be condemned. What are you saying? Some people are going to be condemned because of the deception and the hardness of heart not to see the damage they're doing. That's how serious it is. That's how powerful it is. That's where you and I say, whoa. This is soul stuff. This is heaven, hell. This is my salvation. This is, this, is, this is holy things. This is sacred area. This is an area God doesn't want me to get in. I need to be mindful of my own mouth and what I'm laying my mouth on and what I'm talking about and who I'm, and who I'm saying because I want to be saved. Amen. You know what we need to do? You know what's really good to help you with gossip? Stop judging everybody else's words and start judging your own. Amen. Start saying, I'm not going to care what they're saying. I'm only going to care about my mouth because I want to be saved. I don't care what they're all saying. I'm going to, I'm just. What is the saying? It's better to be quiet and thought a fool than to open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> Words are powerful. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. So why don't you be caught speaking well of others? Why don't you be caught speaking well of people and not against them? Why don't you get caught being the solution to the problem and not the problem? Why don't you believe for the best rather than the worst? I love what this says. Anyone can find the dirt in someone. Be the one that finds the gold. The King James says it like this. He that diligently seeketh good procureth favor. He's saying the person that looks for good in everybody, God says, that's, that's so much like my nature. That's so much like me that I am, I'm going to do something for them. I'm going to give them incredible favor. But he that seeketh mischief, it shall come unto him double fold. The one that seeks for good and looks to procure good and looks for favor, God said, I'm going to give. The person that does that, that's acting like me. I'm going to give them my favor. I'm going to doubly bless them. But the person that looks for the dirt, I'm going to double to them what they look for in their own life. I'm going to bring hardship. I'm going to bring dirt. I'm going to bring pain into the life for what they're doing. I'm just giving you the Bible. Amen. I'm just telling you how it is. I love what Eleanor Roosevelt said. Great minds talk about ideas. Average minds talk about events. Small minds talk about people. <laughs> Eleanor Roosevelt, president's wife. That's what she said. Amen. Which one are you? In today's conversation... Were you talking about great ideas? Were you talking about events, kingdom of God? Or were you talking about people and the problems of life and the minutiae that you're walking through? Three, three questions you need to ask yourself. 
Is my conversation helpful or hurtful? Am I making private matters public? Am I permitting others to gossip? Am I listening? Because listening is just as bad as talking. Amen. What am I doing? Because I have to remember, if you're not a part of the problem or the solution, then it's gossip, and I don't want to be a part of it. Jesus, there's nobody like you. You are so good. The neat thing about you, Father, is you are so overwhelming, full of forgiveness. You humbly give grace and mercy because you know that our human nature gets us so bound up. All of us tonight are guilty of the things that we've heard. All of us, including me, all of us have stepped in something and said things that we regret and we're sorry for. I pray for this congregation tonight that there would be a blanket of anointing, a blanket of restoration, a blanket of healing. God, that we could be the people of God. That, Lord, we could handle these things and realize the danger of them and not allow the toxins to get a hold of us to the place that they become a behavior pattern. But, God, I pray tonight that patterns and things that we find ourselves in could be broken and the strongholds could be loosed. And, Lord, the enemy, the enemy looks for a place to work. The enemy looks. Paul said, neither give place to the devil. Don't even give him an open door because he'll take advantage of it. Father, help us tonight to close the door of opportunity to the enemy and open a door of grace and mercy and humility towards you because we know you resist the prideful, but you are open, full of favor to the humble that admit wrong and that want healing. I pray your blessing on us. I pray your healing on us. I pray your restoration on us, on us God. And I pray you help us to truly be a house of refuge. We ask all of this in the name of Jesus. And everyone said in Jesus' name. Jesus. Amen. God bless you. Now love somebody. Go and love somebody. Shake somebody's hand. Say, I'm so glad that you're a part. Now, you might have to walk up to him and say, I'm so sorry I said something about you. Don't do that. Just work it out with God. <laughs>